Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Gunawante, or you can call me Gunte for short. I'm a lecturer at Petra Christian University, and I will be your master of ceremonies and moderator for this event. On behalf of Petra Christian University, I would like to extend very warm welcome to all of you to the first international guest lecture series of PCU Architecture Department, inviting uh, today is inviting Professor Emeritus Hendresanov. Before we start the guest lecture, let me lead you in prayer and you can pray according to your belief. Uh, let me pray in Christian uh, faith. Dear God, thank you for your goodness and your blessing over us and you have made this international guest lecture happen. Please bless and uh, make us uh, safe during this uh, uh, talk and bless Prof. Sanov and all attendants and that this activity will be a blessing for all of us. Thank you. Amen. Uh, I would like to invite our Dean of Faculty, Civil Engineering and Planning, Petra Christian University, uh, Ms. Ruli Damayanti, PhD, but uh, because she's not present, she will be represented by Dr. Agus Dwi Haryanto. Uh, okay, thank the time you. yours. Okay, Dr. thank you, Bakunde. Uh, good evening or uh, good morning for uh, Prof. Senov to each and uh, to each one of you present today. It is a moment of pleasure to welcome all participants who are present here online to attend this lecture. On behalf of the Department of Architecture, Faculty of Civil Engineering and Planning, Petra Christian University, I offer my regards to all participants joining us. I convey my regards to our professor today, Professor Henry Sanov. Thank you so much for uh, for accepting our invitations. The topic of the lecture today will focus on participatory action research in architecture. I wish this lecture enlightens us all with the approaches to deal with the problems in our research or designs of tomorrow. Thank you so much, Prakundi. Okay, uh, we'll continue. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Dwi. Here's what to expect from tonight's guest lecture which is the wonderful knowledge of participatory action research in architecture. From Sanoff's article written in 2006, participatory action research is defined as a research by people. So research is not only knowledge creation, but is also education for real action. Therefore, I'm introducing Professor Emeritus Henry Sanoff. Uh, Prof. Henry Sanoff is uh, teaching in architecture department, North Carolina State University. He has four decades of research and professional practice experience, mainly concentrated in programming, planning, and designing school facilities. He also has been visiting, uh, he's been a visiting lecturer for more than uh, in 85 institutions, such as University of London, University of Sydney, Melbourne, and etc. He was the USA editor of journal of Design Studies and founder of Environmental Design Research Association, or IDRA. And his latest publication is Participatory Design, A Historical Perspective, 2021, and so many more books. Uh, and maybe I just add one more thing. He has received many awards, NCSU Holiday Medal of Excellence, Phi Kappa Phi Faculty Achievement, and so on. So without further ado, I will introduce our guest lecturer, Prof. Senov, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't have a screen. Oh, OK. Um, yes, I think it's working. Yeah, OK. Uh, how, do I, how do I get rid of the bar across the top? Uh, I, think, I think it's not visible from here. I think it should be fine. I think it's just uh, it's just operation uh, only. It should be fine. Yeah, you can you can go up and down. No worries. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think it's working. Yeah, don't worry. Okay. Um, yeah. The the whole concept of uh, participatory action research is really changing the nature of professional practice. Now, action research was coined by 
a psychologist named Kurt Lewin. And he was really talking to other psychologists and indicating that psychologists need to act on a system to change it. Now, uh, typically, um, psychologists deal with one aspect of a problem. Um, but he's arguing that um, that's insufficient. But the idea of action research has become popular in many, many different fields, um, from criminology, public health. Now, there's an encyclopedia of action research, and it has maybe a thousand people from around the world that have entries in this um, encyclopedia. Actually, I'm the only architect. Now, so participatory action research is based on the belief that people who use the environment, who are the traditional subjects of research, become active participants in the research and in changing the environment. Another way of saying it is community participation. I think as professionals, it's important that we use a language to communicate to people who are not design professionals, which is different than the language that we use to communicate with design and planning professionals. So I tend not to use words like research, action research, sometimes community participation, but mostly the concept of design games. Now, You've all played games, chess, checkers, Monopoly. And one of the interesting features of, of games is that they're engaging. Um, typically, it's small groups playing together. But one of the problems with games is that there are winners and losers. Now, in, in the design and planning world, we can't have losers. Everybody has to be a winner. And so the concept of design games is quite different. It's really based on small group interaction where there are rules, games must have rules, where people kind of make individual decisions and then collective decisions by consensus and not voting. Now, I originally wrote design games in 1975. It was translated into Japanese and in Japan they talk about this as the design game's approach to design and planning. Korean, and just recently in Spanish. So this is what a typical game would look like. Small groups of people uh, working together. And, and what's important about this, many people have something to contribute to any discussion but not everybody feels comfortable in speaking in large groups large groups have a problem of people dominating the group sometimes a political figure a religious figure can dominate a large group all of the projects that i talk i'll talk to you about are basically uh, small groups working together People learn from each other. Um, people have different kind of values. And in a small group, people have a better tendency to listen to each other. Um, the sociological concept is called values clarification. People um, learn and talk to each other. Nobody can, if, if there's an aggressive person, that person can only dominate a few others in a small group. So I'm going to start with the town of Bangalore in Australia. Um, this is the northern, northern tip of Australia. Um, some years ago, there was a plan, and, and this was the, the, the stopover point for people who are driving from Sydney all the way up to the north coast. People would stop for um, a few days or a day. Um, so it's a, a, a tourist attraction. 
and there was a concern that the, the government was going to plan a highway to bypass the town of Bangalore. Um, it, this was maybe 25, 30 years ago, but a very scruffy looking town of one historic building. Now, I was going to be teaching at Sydney, so they asked if I could come a few days earlier to talk to the people in Bangalore because they were concerned that if the highway is built, something could drastically happen in, in the town. They suggested they could put together a team. There's a local historian, architect, and I argued, no, I'll have my own team. And I asked the head of architecture from the University of Sydney to send four students, four architecture students, not knowing what they would do, who I was. They were second year students, third year student, four students, one was a fifth year student. The train ride was I know, six or seven hours from Sydney and four students arrived not knowing what was going to happen other than they would have a place to sleep and uh, food to eat. So the first step was really a walking tour around the town. Now, perhaps the most important thing, the newspaper is very powerful in many towns. Uh, Bangalore is wonderful, says visiting expert. Now, this is really important because in the design and planning world, we tend to take a negative look at issues, you know, solve the problem. Well, if you talk about problem at the beginning of a project, it, it casts a negative impression. If you talk about something positive, people feel good about the town to start with, and then they can talk about the kinds of things that are making changes. Um, the concept is like A, B, C, D, asset-based community development. Always look at the positive features, whether it's a small town or a building. The other thing that's really crucial is that um, when we talk about community, we're talking about everybody. Um, not only adults, but children as well, because they have a stake in what's happening. And of course, in small towns all over the world, um, there's really nothing to do when, when children become students and look for work, so they, they go to large cities. So it's important to find um, the kinds of activities that could occur in the town um, to keep young people in the town. So. The, um, this is an um, elementary school. The older students will make models of what the town could be like. The younger students will do drawings. Now, this is also important because the uh, young people will feel they're a part of the town. They'll talk to their parents about what's happening. So they're, they're a conduit. They're providing information to their parents about what's going to be happening. The first stage in the process is interviewing people. So um, we spent about 30, 40 minutes uh, the entire day uh, with uh, three student groups interviewing people about the positive features of the town and what they would like to see happen. So this, um, based on the information that we got, we um, identified key features of the town that needed to be improved. And so we established a workshop, community workshops, first one the town ever had. And it's called Pride in Place. Again, we have to start with a kind of positive outlook for the town. About 80 people came. And this is a small town, um, 10,000 or more, but the, the, the county is quite large. Um, so, in most of the workshops, it's interesting because male and female people participate. And in some countries, women really don't have an opportunity to have a voice. So the purpose of the workshop is really to talk about what's 
important? What goals um, are important for the development of the town? It's something for young people um, looking at the town's historical character. Now, goals in and of itself is, is okay, but you need to identify the strategies for how to accomplish those goals. So there has to be some kind of plan. And the, once the strategies are identified, then we talk about an action plan. What are the specific actions? Who's responsible to do that? And how much is it going to cost? Now, one thing that's very unique about workshops in Australia, there's a pitcher of beer at every table. Now, you can't do this in the United States, especially in some of the more religious areas. But uh, in places like Japan and Australia, beer is very popular. And, you know, um, sometimes beer helps to stimulate the kind of conversation or discussion. But the, the people themselves request the beer. This is not something that I provide. Now, so the strategy was based on interviews, um, key features were identified. And so the, the town, entrance to the town, and then a sketch of what it could look like. Now, there were second year students, third year students, some you know, were able to do good drawings. But the point was to at least have people talk about what they like or dislike about the existing scene and then uh, what they like or dislike about the design idea. This is what the entrance to the town looks like today. Uh, at the workshop, when uh, there was a discussion about the town entrance, one of the women said she was going to donate 50 palm trees to the town. And so in, in, a, in a day, the entire entrance to the town dramatically changed. Uh, there was a vacant uh, old theater building. Um, and the idea, again, was to have people look at this because if we didn't uh, bring it to their attention, it probably could have been ignored. That's what it looks like today. Um, the existing town at one point had verandas. Verandas are like terraces, um, similar to the drawing below. Now, um, years ago, those verandas were uh, torn, torn down, and a lot of people in the town wanted to bring them back, to bring back the historic character of the town. So this is what the town looked like uh, when we started. This is what it looks like today. Now, one thing about um, planning. The process takes um, several years. So what's essential is really organizing the community to be able to continue the project themselves. And that's what the concept of action planning is. Um, identify what actions are important, who's going to do it. In, in any kind of uh, planning situation, there always is a public and private partnership. Um, the public has um, sometimes federal support, government support, private people have to invest. Now, uh, in Japan, um, I, I probably have been in more cities in Japan than most Japanese people. Um, and I've done a number of projects. I'm showing you one, which is um, um, a town of Nano, which is the northern part of, um, of Japan. Now, Japan, you know, has a lot of people, but not very much land. And in this town, the local government was proposing a recreation area by filling in part of the river. And uh, the town planners and architects spent two years generating proposals which were rejected by the community continuously. So a group of people, some from government, some from uh, private sector, contacted me and asked if I would come to help. Now, 
Um, I think I mentioned earlier, I have an arrangement with my wife that I won't spend more than five days away from home, which is two days travel and three days to do the project, no matter what the project is. And so the first, before I even arrived, I, I wrote and suggested that we arrange a boat ride for students, parents, and teachers around what might be the perimeter of the area of the river that would be filled in for recreation. So there are 60 um, students and teachers. And the idea was to, to first to make sure that the young people are involved because recreation is not only for older people, it's for young people as well. And we wanted them to be part of the whole process. Now, um, often when I do projects in Japan, there are a lot of people that come from different parts of the country to observe what's happening. There's a whole movement that has been in the last 10 years in Japan uh, where people describe themselves as community designers. They're not professional designers, they're not professional planners, but they're interested in the whole idea of bringing the community together to make you know, changes. So um, about 30 people came, but I really don't accept observers, so I had to put everybody to work. So the workshop that we were planning was not unlike the one in Bangalore, but the idea was to identify the whole range of possible objectives for a recreation area. So here there's a team um, brainstorming possible objectives. Then uh, they would uh, interpret it for me. Then the next step is to identify all the activities that could occur in a recreation area and then create graphic symbols that correspond to that each recreation activity. And the symbols had to be done in scale. So for example, come on, um, there could be a playground. So there are eight symbols and the symbol corresponds to the magnitude of the area based on the size of the population. So um, a, a forest area might be twice as large as a, uh, a playground. So it was important to think about the, a relative scale for all of these activities that would be located in the area that was filled. We established a base plan by outlining the perimeter of the filled area. I met with uh, uh, a number of uh, students to talk to them about the entire process that they'd be going through in the workshop. The workshop was held on a Sunday morning, about 80 people attended, small groups. And basically, they were involved with establishing what they thought were the most important objectives for a recreation area, what kinds of activities would occur, and then to locate those activities on the base plan, base map. Now, this was important because um, as designers, you know, there's a concept called trade-offs. You can't always have everything. So you have to make decisions about what's important. Now, typically, I don't use the, the language of trade-off because if you have to define what it is, it's a mistake. But in the process of actually locating the activities they selected, they realize that they all cannot fit in the base map. So they have to make trade-offs. They have to decide which is the most important. So here there are um, men and women working together, um, students working together. There's a women's group cutting and pasting and doing a site plan for the recreation area. Uh, young female students also built a three-dimensional model. Then everybody presented. There's a two-hour process. Everybody presented their ideas. And this is all done in scale. We broke for lunch, and then the next step was to present for each of the teams to present their work to the entire community. About um, 350, 400 people came. It was an auditorium in the museum. 
each, these were all local people presenting their ideas. And this was very important. It wasn't, I, I just outlined the process, but local people. Now, perhaps the, one of the interesting things, there was a, a team of young boys, about 11 years old, and as they were presenting their work, they would say, well, here's a special area in, uh, in this park where our fathers could sit and drink beer. Well, the whole audience exploded because none of the parents would ever say, we need a place where we can drink beer. But uh, young people are totally uninhibited and it became, became very clear how important it is to have young people involved in any process. So we, we kind of assembled all of the ideas that were generated, came up with a, a base plan and the mayor was there and, and the mayor said, well, you know, this is what our uh, government architects and planners have been presenting for the past two years. But the difference was this idea came from the community and the whole concept of a sense of ownership then becomes really important. Now, I have an arrangement with a lot of projects that I do in Japan that if I do a workshop, I expect to see results in one year. In one year, it was built. And then it was expanded for a picnic area. So this is basically a three-day project. And then local people, local architects and planners did the work, um, where in three days, we were able to accomplish what local government couldn't do in two years. Now, um, I also do um, schools other community art centers and a wide range of different kinds of projects. But I'm going to show you schools because schools are important um, because typically what we know about in education doesn't translate into school buildings. Um, I've always argued that, you know, each child has three teachers, a parents, a teacher and a school building. School building sends out messages to children um, and, and architects typically don't think about young people or teachers when they're designing schools. In some countries, um, standard plans are used for building schools, no matter what the climate, no matter what the site looks like. Now, um, in this, this is a, a small town. Um, where the existing school was um, impossible to um, maintain, it was deteriorated. <coughs> and the idea was to build, <coughs> build a new school um, close to where the existing school, school was. So the first step is always involve the children. All the children had to talk about. Now, this is what appeared in the newspaper. The Davidson School designed with kids in mind, kids drawing was on the front page. Now this is really important because um, the press can be an enemy or it can be an ally. And quite often um, we, we see negative uh, information coming out of the press, especially when it has to do with architecture and planning. But the process was with teachers and parents and children, we don't use the concept of goals because a lot of times you have to you know, define what a goal means. But I use the concept of a, I call it a poem, a wish poem, where parents and teachers and children complete the phrase, I wish my school. All the teachers do this, all the children do this, and it's done by different grades, first grade, second grade, third grade. And the parents and the P Parent Teachers Association do this. And so we have a lot of data. And what we do is uh, uh, call it content analysis. Look at which of the concepts that keep reappearing most frequently. So uh, I wish my school was warm, colorful, and friendly, small, intimate feeling, beautiful, unique, and interesting, lots of sunlight. I never heard teachers say we want an ugly school. 
So each group, um, teachers and parents, the parents wanted um, entry. Uh, I, I wish my school to be state and nationally recognized. Now, typically, it's usually architects who try to be the advocates for beautiful buildings. But here, the parents want a building that would be state and nationally recognized. So right to begin with, before any work is done, there's a support mechanism of the wish poem. Um, and it's, it's really a charge for the architect to do something nationally recognized. So we did a series of workshops with teachers um, where the teachers, independent of what subject they taught, really were looking at educational objectives. How do, how do students learn? What are the different methods? Going back to what they learned when they were studying to be a teacher which they don't practice anymore. Um, so one of the techniques is a, a, a deck of cards of pictures of places. Now, what we try to do is to sensitize teachers to the physical environment and how the physical environment can support specific teaching methods. So there are lots of pictures of different places where different form of learning could occur, not only in school buildings, but in the community as well. Now, these were created specifically that they won't match perfectly any teaching method. So the teachers have to look at these pictures and begin to you know, think about how it has to change to make it work for a particular learning method. Whoops, sorry. So this is really the first step in really sensitizing teachers to the physical environment and how it, it actually can be a third teacher. So they're always working together, small groups. Um, they, they go through two or three different phases. Phase one is establishing um, important learning methods. They have to agree. Then they select the pictures to satisfy those learning methods. Um, the, there are several other um, aspects of the workshop, but the most interesting is the site planning. In many, in many countries, um, there are what you call educational specifications, or there's a laundry list um, of the number of rooms and the size of the building. And in this particular moment, there were four schools being built at the same time same budget, different sites. This was the only school where we actually worked with the children, uh, the parents, and teachers. But also, when we opened up the workshop to the community, there were local artists in, in the town. And the artists wanted to be able to display their work, painting and sculpture. And so they were part of the workshop as well. So the, the groups came together and started looking at um, ways in which they can satisfy the requirements. And, and one of the issues that came up regularly was sunlight, lots of sunlight, because the, their experience in the previous school was that um, the classrooms were um, along a corridor. It was called a double loaded corridor, classrooms on both sides of the corridor, which meant that some classrooms face south some classrooms face north. South has direct sun, north doesn't. So the teachers and the students were complaining that it's often very cold on one side and very warm on the other side. So one of the key ingredients was to, to have all the classrooms facing south. So they started working and there was even a local architect involved. And then they presented their work and they said, well, you know, we can't solve the problem. You're the architect, you solve the problem. Now, this is really important because most people do not know what architects do. Uh, some of you are students. Did you ever explain to your parents what you do? 
They may not understand unless they're also architects. Now, the thing that's important to remember forever is that as professionals, you will be in contact with people not unlike your parents. But the one thing that's different, your parents love you. So they all presented their work and they all agreed they couldn't solve the problem. So this was our responsibility to solve the problem. So we took um, all their work, looked at it, and I came up with a sketch of um, uh, three clusters of classrooms all facing south. Now, the other thing that was important was the idea of having a place for artists, painters, and sculptors to exhibit their work. So there were a series of uh, towers which became exhibition areas. Um, the plans were brought to the school, teachers were making comments about um, things that needed to be changed. The final plan was developed. Now, one thing that was interesting about this, the teachers talked about having an outdoor classroom. Now, not all learning occurs indoors, um, but uh, in many, many countries, um, governments don't allow more than one entrance to a classroom, which is typically along the corridor. Now, if you're going to have an outdoor uh, classroom, it means you need uh, another entrance. So here, for example, is one entrance to the classrooms from the corridor and another to the outdoor uh, classroom. It's a very controversial issue um, with the state government and the community was very strong. Uh, 100, about 100 parents and teachers came together and said that this is the plan that we wanted and so this is the way it was actually built. So these are the towers, um, uh, the galleries for the artists, uh, painters and sculptors to display their work. Now, what was equally important, since the artists were part of the community and part of the school system, they worked with teachers in, in expanding this whole concept of ownership. Um, artists work with the children. This is, you know, after about a year. Each leaf on the tree has a child's name in it. Now, this was... Um, about 20, 20, 25 years ago, the young people, some of them who are 10 year old now, are married and have children and bring their children to the school to show them their parents' name on the leaf. So the impact of this as a school that the community owns is tremendous. This, the students are doing drawings. Um, there are names on each one of the houses. These are the houses in the community. So over the years, the walls are lined with murals done by students with architects. And, and so the quality of artwork is phenomenal. Newspaper, head, headlines in the newspaper, kids get user-friendly school. This is what the school looked like when we just completed it. And this is what the school looks like today. Now, I haven't spoken about the concept of post-occupancy evaluation, which means that, you know, uh, when you design something, you're making assumptions, but then you have to validate those assumptions. So you have to go back. And so we have been going back um, every five or six years. And the quality of the environment has improved. There's a strong sense of ownership. And ownership is really one of the key issues in uh, successful b buildings, any kind of buildings. Um, in Minnesota is a um, state in the northern part of the United States, which is very cold and very snowy. And we live in the southern part of the United States where the sun shines all the time. So in, in the United States, architects uh, are, are selected to submit proposals. And we were invited um, to submit a proposal for a master plan for 
um, this site, which was a uh, school of Minnesota Center for Arts Education. This building that exists was originally a Bible college, which went bankrupt, and it was bought by the state, and the interior was converted to uh, arts activities, dance, um, music, theater. And um, we started with, we had, there's a two-stage process. First stage, um, you need to submit a master plan to the state government before you're allowed to uh, propose any kind of physical changes. So in order to do that, we interviewed students. We established um, basically a program called Spatial Data Inventory. We identified every classroom in the entire uh, buildings, uh, the amount of space that was available and what was needed. And this was done with discussions of each of the students and teachers in each one of the activity areas, whether it's dance, whether it was theater, whether it was media arts, music. Here I'm meeting with uh, uh, library people. Again, we use the symbols. Uh, the symbols correspond to every single activity that could occur in this um, complex. And again, it was also done in scale. So for example, um, the student services is quite small, theater is quite big, always in scale. Now there, in this school, arts education, none of the students knew anything about design. There was no design at all. It was purely arts. Now one of the problems, first thing is that the, the way the campus was laid out, uh, the buildings were not connected. And this was like the old Bible college. And when the students would go from one building to the other, um, it was so cold that their fingers would freeze. And if you're playing a guitar or picking up a paintbrush, that can be really disastrous. So the plan was to have a workshop with all of the students because they were the experts. Uh, whether it was dance, whether it was music, theater, they were the experts. They knew more about it because they experienced it. And so all of the students were involved, all of the teachers were involved. It was a, uh, maybe a two and a half or three hour workshop, which included lunch. Uh, some of the teachers couldn't sit on the floor to work, so they had a little table. And so working on the floor, um, basically what they were doing is um, taking the activities and locating them on the uh, campus plan. Where should they occur? And then they presented their work. And this was really you know, a wonderful experience for them because first of all, they were um, treated as uh, experienced dancers, uh, visual artists, musicians, presenting their ideas. So the presentation was really quite fabulous. Then we hung up um, about maybe 35 or 40 different site plans. Now, um, what you see, the yellow, that's all new construction, basically covering that existing building, which everybody thought was, was very ugly. So yeah, um, the yellow was all new construction. And the idea was to connect all the pieces. So the master plan was really essential uh, in order to get approval to continue. Now, we, we learned as we were doing this that state government only allows about six or seven million dollars for any individual project at a time. So it's necessary to establish priorities of which were the important activities. And it turned out that the music building was the highest priority. Um, the um, teachers and administrators looked at the site plan and all agreed that that's exactly what they were talking about. Uh, this is the color-coded master plan uh, and the blue represented first priority. So when this was done, it was presented and then we were allowed to continue by 
a presentation for the design of the music school. So we went back to Minnesota, met with all the students and all the teachers and a lot of government officials came because they couldn't believe that we were able to bring so many people together in a very short period of time and reach agreement. So the press was here, everybody was watching it. And um, we had a, a several alternatives for the music school. Um, each group presented their ideas. Oops. Um, this is the music school. This is that ugly building that you saw earlier. Um, there's a parent teachers group and all the results were presented to them. And uh, whoops. the model was built. I have a very lively mouse. A model was built and then the building was built, completed, and we won an award. But the United States, things happen very quickly. So the governor who was supportive of the whole process, even though we were from another state, was not reelected. So the, um, there was never a continuation of the development of the master plan. But this first project was built and was quite successful. Um, so it, it doesn't make any difference if it's a, a new building or a remodeling or an addition. This is an old building from the 1970s. This was typical of what schools looked like at the time. And um, here I teamed up with a former student of mine who has an office. Uh, we've been working together for about 20 years. Plus, um, I started a PhD program. A PhD was a community and environmental design. Now, in a PhD, you don't have design studios, but when you're talking about community, it was necessary to have the community experience. So I teamed up with uh, several of my PhD students and uh, one, two architects from the firm of the Adams Group. Now this is a small project, project six classroom edition. But one of the issues that we were trying to address is the criticism that if you involve people in the process, you're only going to achieve what they've already experienced. So this innovation is not possible. So the purpose of um, showing you this is to show you that that's absolutely wrong because people can accept ideas that they've never seen before. So this is a six classroom extension to an existing school building. So the first step was a kind of rediscovery. The teachers had to walk through the classrooms and we developed a rating scale where they had to rate not only their own classroom, but all the classrooms. Um, and it, the rating scale um, had to do with spatial qualities, physical attributes, furniture. And teachers, many people, tend to um, uh, adjust very quickly to unsatisfactory conditions. And so we wanted to change that whole process. And so we developed the, the workshop. All the teachers participated. We were actually working on two schools on this campus, um, classroom extensions. Now, the idea was to look at the classroom. So we, we reviewed about 200 schools around the world to look at different classroom arrangements. And each one of these arrangements is for 50 students. Um, the conventional classrooms plus uh, various shapes and we also developed criteria based on the education literature what was important for uh, learning um, teachers working in small groups and working together always working in groups making individual decisions then agreeing now this is important too because Typically, people who are not designers cannot read plans. Now here, by actually showing these kind of uh, perspective drawings, 
people were walking through and if one person didn't understand, they would explain it to somebody else. So that everybody had a very clear grasp of um, what, the, what the scheme was like. So all the teachers agreed, this is an L-shaped class, two L-shaped classrooms. And this, the criteria was, students could turn learning activities, variety of teaching methods, team teaching, uh, student sense of privacy. This was really important because none of the teachers had ever experienced an L-shaped classroom. And they all agreed this, is, this was what they wanted. Uh, this is the old Mac. And these are some of the PhD students actually working on the community project. Um, the design workshop, um, we, there was agreement in the last workshop that the L-shaped classroom was appropriate. So the next step was to come up with design alternatives. Two alternatives were developed. The, the gray is the existing building and the um, six classroom addition is in the brown. So they had to select which um, scheme in terms of safety, visual appearance, um, relationship of classroom to the existing building, teacher-friendly classroom addition, and they all selected this. So we did it. That was the classroom addition. And that's what it looks like. Now, this was interesting because one of the issues with L-shaped classrooms is that you don't have the traditional linear corridor there are breakout spaces so that the students can spill out in, into the hallway into those breakout spaces. So you don't have the image of traditional corridors. Now, when the, the building was completed, all the teachers in the school wanted to go into these classrooms, but the principal uh, couldn't do that. So they had, uh, kindergarten and first grade go into the classrooms. Um, one of the issues that's become very popular um, in the last 10, 15 years around the world is um, riverfront development, mostly in terms of tourist activities. Now, this was another project where um, uh, the PhD students were involved, uh, working with me to have that kind of um, community experience. This is a small town in the middle of the United States, Owensboro, Kentucky, a um, small town where most of the people that live there were born there. So uh, this is what the riverfront looked like. Now, in different cities in the state, uh, the government provided funds for riverfront development so the mayor of the city said, well, we should try that also because this is a very desolate riverfront. But his concept of um, getting people involved was to hire a landscape architect to propose a plan and then invite the community to react to it. Now, there's a, a, an NGO private foundation that's been doing a lot of work in healthcare with the community. And, uh, and they were very, very powerful people. And they argued that that's really not what it's all about. So they did a net search. And they, they saw a number of uh, planning and landscape firms that had specific proposals for riverfront development, which they didn't like. And they found a book that I wrote, um, Community Participation Methods in Design and Planning. So they called and asked me if I would come and talk to them about the town. Um, this is a street adjacent to the riverfront, which is interesting because while most cities have changed the character, this has the same um, hundred year old character. So before I came, I said, I'd like to organize a meeting specifically with the principals of the schools. There's a technical school, high school, middle school, because I wanted to meet with them because in, in a project of this scope for this small town, 
public-private partnerships were essential. So even if they were able to get money from the government, that wasn't sufficient. There had to be a lot of private investment. And so uh, I met with the school principals, and the idea was to involve the students in the development of the riverfront. And the teachers had to figure out what would be the best way they could do it that would fit into their kind of educational process. Of, of course, the press is always involved. So what was happening was absolutely unbelievable because uh, the high school teachers were meeting with the kindergarten teachers and they had teams of a high school t uh, student, 16 year old, and a five year old, a six year old, working together on projects. And this was happening throughout the town. Now, th this is a lot of fun for the students also, not only for the young ones, but for the older ones as well. Uh, they were building models, doing drawings, telling their parents what was going on. It has the contagion effect. And they built a model of the entire uh, riverfront. Um, there was a workshop. Uh, the workshop had 125 people in a small town, which is really remarkable. Now, the workshop included um, key legislators from the state, mayor, ex-mayor, a wide range of different people. Now, over the course of the project, there were a number of focus groups where um, teams would go to um, churches, um, community centers, elderly housing, to get people's ideas of what kinds of activities could occur on the riverfront. I explained the process that we were going through. Um, the state legislators, I mean, men, women, young people, older people. Whoops. So the, the riverfront was um, developed in three different areas. These are a whole series of objectives that came out of our discussions. Um, and each group had to identify the most three most important objectives and which activities would support those objectives. Senior citizens, elderly people, and then the students would just present their ideas. And the presentation was very important. All the groups presented their ideas. So for example, uh, Objectives for this segment of the riverfront attract people and investment to the riverfront, create a visually pleasing order to the riverfront, develop an arts entertainment district, and the activities are arts and crafts, retail shop, restaurant, park, riverfront. This is a typical uh, plan. So not only were they identifying locating the symbols, but they were also making notes of what they thought were important. And so um, this was a summary of all the activities that should occur in different parts of the riverfront. So uh, this building was the building where the workshop was held. Um, once we completed the project, some people emerged. And today, this is what it looks like. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, this is a small small town, uh, less than 100,000 people, and it's attracting tourists, but most importantly, it's for the people who live there. So that um, workshop that just took, uh, uh, workshop was just one day, uh, a couple of days, helped to generate uh, an idea where there was a strong sense of ownership, that people own this area. Um, the most recent book that describes um, a lot of the case studies is called Participatory Environmental Design. But the classic book, which has been used for about 20 years, is called Community Participation Methods in Design and Planning. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Henry Sanoff, for the wonderful talk. Uh, yeah. May I, I might uh, just summarize a little bit. Uh, so the key points from your talk, we understand that we need to involve the local residents and utilize uh, 
models, maps, uh, or symbols that are understood by the local residents to, to create the workshops, right? So uh, there are, I just want to highlight that there are uh, 106 external participants from uh, outside of Petra Christian University at the, uh, 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 registering to come to the, the talk, but unfortunately, maybe not all coming. It's only 61 at the moment, uh, 61 people at the moment. And uh, I just uh, read some of the university that have the, have come, University of Nottingham, Ningbo, China, CUNY Graduate Center, New York, University of Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil, some universities from Java and Celebes and in Indonesia locally, UN Habitat, Garamin, uh, one of the advocacy movement of disability people in uh, NTT in uh, Nusa Tenggara, uh, in its eastern part of Indonesia, and uh, Sika, the producer of um, building material. Okay, there are several questions, interesting questions uh, that are already asked by the, uh, for the participants that need to be, need to ask the questions. Uh, please chat first in the, uh, in the chatting box because I need to rearrange uh, the, the similar questions. Okay, uh, for the first question, uh, it's actually from Mr. Daniel, our student. Uh, sorry, Prof. Senov, can you see the chat box or do you want me to read it for you? Uh, you cannot see that? Okay, maybe I just read it for you. Can you share? Uh, it's okay. Can, can you share your experience in participatory action research in developing countries or uh, in area that are less wealthy? Yeah, maybe because I saw your, uh, maybe um, Mr. Daniel uh, mentioned, uh, he means that your sample is more uh, in Japan or America or Australia that are quite wealthy in economy. Do you have any sample or any approach for developing countries like Indonesia that we have so much limitation? Sorry. Of course. Um, I can't show you everything that I've done because it's been 40 years worth of projects. But yeah. yes, I do a lot of work in Mexico. Okay. Uh, in very small rural villages. Um, Mexico has been probably um, where I've done most of the work because it's very close to the United States. And a okay. lot of my work has been translated into Spanish. Okay. So um, yes, um, the, the, the techniques don't change. They're the same. Okay. Um, because there's local people that need to you know, do it themselves. Mm. So is it the same uh, methods that you apply so far in yes. Mexico? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. So um, it's... When I first started doing this, there was an article in a Swiss architectural magazine that talks about how I've developed techniques for illiterate people now, not necessarily literate people, but we've worked with people who cannot read and write, but the symbols work with, with anybody. Okay. Thank you so much for the questions. Uh, maybe I will move to Ms. Berti from Garamin. Uh, Prof. Henry, it is interesting to see how community or students can participate on research. However, may I ask something? Uh, do you see the changes how people with disability or other vulnerable people being involved as researchers or uh, maybe as designers? And sorry, do, do you have any? Sure. Uh, when um, we started in North Carolina in the 80s, the disability movement and for the whole United States. Okay. Uh, and now the strategy, one of the strategies was um, how do you get, especially in universities, how do you get 
um, university administrators to provide support for those people with different disabilities to negotiate the environment. And so the first step was to create a role-playing game where we, in North Carolina there are 16 campuses that are part of the system. We invited the key person from every campus who is in charge of finance to come to our city at 16 people and had 16 students. The key administrators were assuming the role of some form of disability, blind, in a wheelchair, with crutches. And they were assigned to go to two or three different locations on the campus. Now, there was always a student with them so they wouldn't hurt themselves. Now, the student teams, the students then assumed the role of the university administrators. And as the university administrators moved around with a crutch or a wheelchair, they came back exhausted, angry at how difficult it was to move through the campus. And all of a sudden, money began to appear to make physical changes. Elevators were put in uh, to buildings that had uh, more than one story. Um, sidewalks were changed. A whole range of different things occurred. And um, one of my PhD students in Turkey has done something similar and the campus was changed dramatically. So actually, the, the role playing game is very powerful because when people experience the situation, of what it's like to be in a wheelchair, what it's like to be blind, what it's like to have crutches. Not, and not only that, but we began to realize in the United States that um, at some point, almost everybody is temporarily disabled. Pregnant women, athletes, continuously breaking arms, breaking legs. So it's really not for this kind of narrow population. It's really for everybody. So yes, there's no, uh, it, it, it's, it's a common issue throughout. Okay, maybe I will try to ask or to invite Ms. Perti. She's actually my colleague from uh, North. Uh, can, can you respond to Prof. Henry Sandoff? Because it's quite interesting. You're, you have done several participatory action research yourself, right? Can you share a little bit on your case in Kupang, in Ntt? Yeah. Thank you, Pak Gunawan. Thank you, Prof. Henry, for your thought. And I'm really interested because we are doing like a the research in a village called Boilobin, and it is uh, we want to show to the local people that people with disability have the right to access for the public building uh, at their uh, village offices. And uh, we came on the in the village. One of my friends with disability she did a great work, like being uh, make a friend with the villagers and then try to have like some key person and it involves uh, a man with disability and some women with disability. So we have, like we say that uh, women with disability and pregnancy as well. So they have multiple, multiple disability on that village. And then uh, we saw that when they want to like having later or they want to have like service from the a village uh, officer it's hard for them because we we uh, love stairs so much in our uh, place like uh, churches and so many public buildings we have so many stairs and it is uh, hard for people with physical disability to uh, go there and one day uh, we want to like make the ramp enter, but uh, we don't know the measure because we. But we we have the local resources, like the carpenter and then people who can help us. But I don't know how to measure it. So I I learned universal design, mm. but I'm not an architect. 
but we try to do our best. So we uh, invite one of my friends to study, uh, who she is an architect, and then she teach the local uh, village, uh, local people in the village, and then we did it. But we involved uh, one friend, she is a researcher, so she also can uh, try to use the to use her wheelchair to do it. But uh, yeah, it is important that. Yes. We can use the local material, not like in the Western country. They have okay. like uh, good material, but we try our best. And participatory action research, it's, uh, it's so perfect that we use okay. it in the community. Thank you. Abunawa. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Berti. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe that's a good uh example also that we in indonesia try to use the participatory action research prof Sanof. um do you have any comment on that uh, small research utilizing the real people with disability uh, is it better or is it or maybe just is it similar like your practice in in us um well you know um We've been doing this for more than 30 years. Hmm. So changes don't occur overnight. Okay. It takes a long time and it takes a lot of persuasion. Hmm. Um, and it's not only in the rural areas for poor people, but in cities, yes. the problem is, you know, even something like um, changing the sidewalks hmm. so that a wheelchair, uh, can go from the sidewalk to the street. That becomes controversial because people who are blind don't like that because they use the edge of the curb to guide them where the end of the street is. So not only is it difficult to make the changes, but there are different populations that have different requirements. So it yes. becomes even more complicated. Yes. Mm. Okay. So more uh, people with disability or other vulnerable people involved, it should be better, right? Okay, uh, we have another question from Miss Luciana Cristanto. She, uh, she's actually our lecturer. How many people usually you can involve? Uh, how many people can you invite in the one project? Uh, so, uh, the project can be effective and also in three days you can you, you said you you need only three days to do the international, international projects yes it doesn't yes. make any difference the, um, the numbers 100 200 it doesn't make any difference you just need a large okay. enough so that people can work in small groups oh so you 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 can chunk make it a uh, groups from 100 right so oh, sure. you make every five people a group or something like that do you mean that's right. Okay. Always, never, never work with the entire group. It's always got to be small groups. So it doesn't oh, make okay. any difference how many people. It's just a question of whether you have enough space available for mm. all those people. Okay. Okay. Uh, there is a question from Mr. Bag uh, Mr. Bagas, also from PCU students. Maybe uh, I have another question from, sorry, I just summarize first. I think it's different. Maybe, maybe I will. I will read, Mr. Bagas. Do you have any uh, experience in Asian culture that have no uh, that have different political condition, like in U.S. or Australia? People have uh, freedom of speech, but in Asian countries, sometimes we have less freedom in speech or yeah, militaristic. Uh, 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 regime or something. Do you have uh, experience in Asian countries with difficult situation, political situation? The only Asian countries that I worked in extensively is Korea and Japan. Oh, okay. okay. But now there's another kind of problem. Mm. It's a cultural problem mm. in Asian okay. countries, irrespective of the political situation, because typically 
age is very important in Asian countries. Mm. So when we put a group of people together, if they're, and it doesn't make any difference, people can come from government, can be farmers. Um, typical situation is if there's an older person at the table, no matter what the rank of the other people are, they refuse to say anything because age okay. this is respected. So the whole concept of okay. design games has had a mm. big impact in Korea and Japan mm. because people are, are reluctant to begin with, but after a while, men and women are communicating, old people and young people are communicating. So it's had a, a real major cultural uh, impact. Yes. Now, I haven't worked in, uh, well, I, I guess there are uh, examples in the United States of um, very conservative communities. Um, you might call them racist communities. Um, mm. and, uh, the only projects I accept in this, some of these communities where they're black and white people is if both groups are uh, available and eligible to participate. If they're not, mm. I don't accept the project. So, I mean, I do have kind of basic requirements of the kinds of projects that I accept. Uh, there has to be an openness to political to uh, participation. Uh, okay. There has to be an openness to all people to be involved. Okay, so openness is the, the key keywords like for uh, successful PAR. Okay, uh, there is another question from Yoranga, Mr. Yoranga from ITB. Uh, he says, thank you for your presentation. Based on your experience in several workshops, how do you engage the community in the first place so they can uh, become or they can trust you yeah. and uh, to join the workshop enthusiast enthusiastically? Yeah, yeah. because well, sometimes they, they only have several uh, days, right? So it's really hard to... Well, first of all, I have to be invited into the community. Mm. That's critical. If I'm not invited, I can't do anything. It's impossible. Okay. So that's the key point. So typically, it will be local people, sometimes um, government, sometimes local people organize, know about my work, and will invite me. Um, not knowing how I'm going to work, but knowing that there's going to be some kind of community involvement. So you, it's difficult to go, to go into some place. It's difficult, for example, for the government to go into a community and try these projects, try this process, if the community is not already open and willing to accept it. There's always, in many, many places around the world, um, people are suspect of government intervention. Even you know, United States, Japan, and people mm. don't participate if it's government sponsored because typically government doesn't listen. And that happens in the United States all the time. Mm. Uh, so it really depends on um, uh, being invited because they, they expect there's going to be some kind of community activity. Okay, one more. Actually, uh, maybe I misread the, the last question from Mr. Yoranga. How, how about the board, boredness? Sometimes people don't feel excited. <laughs> how do you change the the situation to become interesting so well, if, there if are people, two questions if people come to the workshop they're not going to be bored it's not going to happen because they're okay. working in a small group so it's only if you have to sit back and listen do you become bored hmm. but if you're actually engaged and there are rules and you have to kind of follow the rules individual decision group decision individual decision group decision so you're going to be talking all the time okay the level of conversation will vary by the culture. Uh, some cultures are more respectful, some are more aggressive, but nobody is bored in this process. Okay. So with your games and your uh, maps and may maybe the, also the model, I saw man many models in, in your drawings, I mean, in your, in your PowerPoint. So it can make the uh, process interesting, right? So you, you can create people playing, so-called playing and designing. Okay, uh, I think we all, we only have one more questions. 
and maybe I want. I, I actually, I am really, I really want to ask you. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, the other the audience. I just want to know: Is there any limitation? Because you mentioned for international project, you only have three days, right? Like the Japan project, you only have three days. Is there any limitation? Uh, or is there any difference between the three days workshops and then maybe the two months workshops in US? I mean, because you, you have some longer projects, right? Is there um, any difference between the short project and then the, the long projects? Fundamental difference, because the work that I do in the United States is really, I work as an architect. So you're involved in many phases of the project. The work that I do internationally is more community organization because it's the local people in that town that have to you know, execute the work, continue the work. So it's basically a, a different role that I play internationally compared to uh, the United States. Okay. So which one is better, the short one or, or the, the whole process with participatory process? For, for me, the yes. short process. Um, oh, okay. Because I like, to, you know, like the commandos. I have to come in quick, do the work, get everybody excited, so they can actually do the work themselves. That's much more exciting. Um, okay. work, work in the United States kind of gets stretched out and travel becomes a problem and I get bored also. So, so I enjoy okay. the short, intensive okay. work. Okay, thank you so much. I think uh, because of the time constraint, it's already uh, almost limited. Maybe I will uh, offer, uh, is there any question? Or maybe is there any comment from Dr. Dwi or Miss Fanny or Miss Alfina? Before I close the or thank you so much for uh, the wonderful presentation and the question and answer. I think we need uh, we need to applause again, Prof Sanov. And so uh, yeah, I would like to ask Miss Alvina some assistance. Uh, do we need to? Uh, are we going to take photos for the whole? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Uh, so uh, before we end our uh, first, or maybe first from Petra Christian University, I would like to thank all participants and uh, also Prof Sanov and all participants uh, that come and also ask questions to this wonderful uh, uh, guest lecture. Don't forget to ask, uh, to, to fill up the guest lecture attendance and uh, feedback uh, we have some feedback forms for our uh, uh, organization. Uh, we also want to do some, sorry. Okay. Oh, sorry. Maybe I uh, will ask one uh, short sharing from Petra University. Uh, this is Miss Sylvie. She's actually involved in service learning. Maybe only five minutes, Miss Sylvie or maybe not more than 10? Miss Sylvie? Yes. Okay, okay I will I share a little see. bit that. Uh, okay. I will share a little bit about uh, our class. Actually, okay. in this class, uh, the lecturers are three. One of them uh, Wait, wait, wait. maybe <laughs> I need to put you inside the frame. Okay, yes, please oh, continue. Okay. Okay, maybe I will introduce uh, Miss Sylvie a little bit. She's uh, a junior lecturer in our uh, university and she's involved with service learning in Wonosalam. Yeah, please continue. Okay, uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, yes, please continue. Okay, as I said before that uh, this class actually is a service learning class. Um, in this class, we have uh, three lecturers. 
The first one is uh, Mrs. Ani Juniwati, and then Mr. Wirawan, and myself, uh, Silviana. So in this uh, project, actually we are really interested with the profile. Uh, the project is located in the J Jara village. It's uh, one of the villages in the Jombang city. So it's actually located in the 482 meters above sea levels. And the climate is very uh, cool because um, the temperature is about 25 to 28 degrees Celsius and they have uh, and they have so many uh, natural environment that it's really interesting and beautiful and after we study about this place we found that they have uh, two uniqueness. The first one is about the religious harmony, their tolerance, and it's proved by some students from Miami Dade College, Florida, United States. They came to this village to learn how they manage the tolerance uh, between the various uh, religious. And the second uni uniqueness that we found that is about the various religious festivals. So for example, uh, this one, the left pictures is, uh, we call it the Tumpeng, um, the Tumpeng Mangos. So it's like Mangosti, right? The Mangosti, Mangosti. because, yeah, Mangosti. So, Mangosti. yes. Uh, I'm a bit nervous. I'm so sorry. So uh, it's about uh, when they have a harvesting and then the number of the harvesting is uh, so much. So it's it's like their, um, it's like their celebration of the harvesting event. And then the second pictures on the right side it's a melasti, so it's, it's actually a festival of the Hindu followers. Uh, and then we think that those two uniqueness uh, must be highlighted. So we decided to make a gallery of religious harmony. So in this place, uh, it's a place that can be used for a villagers and also a place to exhibit various religious activities in the Jarak village uh, in order to enhance the strength point of their tolerance. So uh, we decided to have the project in this area. So this area is... Uh, is in the it's on the uh place on this place called Bukit Pencaringan. So it's a uh, Pencaringan Hill in English. And talk about the process. So we have a uh, we are ongoing actually. So we have the the field survey by the lecturer to discuss with the village government. And then uh, in this case, we want to know uh, their hopes and their needs. And then after that, uh, we have a discussion with the students, what we are going to do and what kind of uh, space that we want to provide. And then after that, uh, the third steps is, we had the field survey with the students so that the students can also feel the situation and then uh, interview the uh, the locals. And because we are in the pandemic era, so not all the students, they're allowed by their parents to go to the site. So we had two types of interview. The first one is uh, online and then we have on-site as well. And then the uh, the fourth steps, it's a brainstorming. 
So in this case, uh, both the lecturers and the students, we had already go to the sites and then interviewing the locals. Then after that, we have a brainstorming and uh, we let the students to give the ideas and then the options. And then after that, we have a discussion and finalization. So actually, now we are on the brainstorming and we are ongoing to have the finalizations of the project design. Then the six and the seven, we haven't done yet, but uh, we will present uh, our ideas to the locals, like a public hearing. And then after that, we, uh, after we hear their comments and then we will uh, do the revising and starting the constructions. And uh, this is some of the documentations. Thank and you. And here we have yes. the ongoing process. It's still ongoing, so I haven't. Uh, we have uh, we haven't finalized it yet. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Sylvie. Uh, yeah. Uh, just want to show a little bit, Prof. Sanov, that we are actually also implementing participatory action research in service learning courses, not, not all courses yet, but in service learning courses. And this is only one example. Uh, I'm also doing service learning for people with disability and also Miss Christine also doing service learning for children. So uh, that's why we invite you because we are really, really in, interested in this and hopefully uh, in the future we can do some collaboration, although with Zoom or other methods uh, or maybe we can buy your design games <laughs> I, i'm 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 a big fan for for actually i want to admit in front of everybody i'm a big fan of you because i read your books and try to implement in my research uh in my phd too okay so uh, uh thank you so much for this wonderful talk uh without any uh big because of time limitation and i know you have waited uh, for us since two, two hours ago. <laughs> so uh, I just want to give uh, 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 the ex organizer to do some photo taking. Uh, maybe, Bu Elfina? Yes. Uh, Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Dear, okay. Dear sir and madam, please open up your camera and look at the camera. There are two pages here. So the first page is, so, so the first page, look at the camera. Okay, smile, one, two, three. Okay. okay, for the second page, okay, look at the camera. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, done. Thank you so much. Thank you. For... Yeah, thank you so much. And I will uh, I will close this uh, event. Thank you so much for Prof. Sanov. And I will return this to Ms. Dr. Dewey. Do you want to have a closing or any last comments? No, I think it's enough, uh, Pak Gunawan. Thank you so much, Prof. Sanov for this uh, lecture, very interesting and very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you again, Prof. Sanov, and we will dismiss uh, uh, this event. Thank you so much for all participants. Terima kasih, Bapak Ibu. Kita akan berpisah. Acaranya sudah selesai. Kami akhiri sampai di sini. Thank you so much, Prof. Sanov. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Prof. Sanov. Thank you. So much, Prof. Sanof. Thank you. Thank you.